Well, Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the service of Brookhaven Church. I'm coming to you from our studio here at our church, and we are just so delighted to have the opportunity, the ability, the technology to be able to come to you there in your home or on your computer or your phone or ever how you're watching us. Uh, praise God for the technology that enables us to be able to do things like this. And so um, what a wonderful uh, new year God is putting before us here, 2021. Man, it was it's hard to believe it was a year ago that we were entering 2020 and we all had uh, great ideas of what we thought 2020 was going to bring. We had our plans, we had our dreams, we had our visions, our goals, and then you know about uh, May or about March rather, uh, everything changed and it just took on a whole different direction. But I just want to remind us all, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, it says, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And even though 2020 threw a curveball to you and me and all the world, it didn't throw any curveballs to God. Uh, I just want to remind you, this didn't interrupt the plan of God. Uh, this COVID-19 didn't somehow put God's work on hold. It didn't put God in pause mode, uh, waiting for the pandemic to be over. God has been at work. God has been doing some incredible things in the world, and God has done some miraculous, amazing things in our church, in our church family, and he's done great things for you. Your life has been filled with God's amazing blessings and grace and love and goodness all through this year. So it's important that you and I don't get defined by our circumstances. We don't allow the, the negative things of the press and social media and all that bombards us don't let that define how you view 2020. You need to view it through the lens of God, that God has a plan, God is on the throne, God is in control, and God is at work. So as we go into 2021, we go into this new year making our plans, praying, asking God to guide us and show us what to do, but always holding our plans open before the Lord and recognizing that he can change and determine our steps in the way that he wants them to go. And that's what we want anyway, right? We want God's will to be done for God is good and God knows what he's doing. And so I look forward to this year. I believe this year is going to be a great year and I believe that God's going to do some incredible things for you and for me and through us to touch this community and touch this world for Jesus Christ. And so we look forward to this coming new year. I'm looking forward to getting back uh, together in person uh, as a church uh, just as soon as we possibly can. Uh, this last Thursday, I met with um, Brother Mike Mossberg, our executive pastor, and our executive leadership team of our deacons. And we talked about, uh, just in light of what's going on uh, with the pandemic and uh, the latest uh, information that we have, uh, we, we're trying to make the best, wisest decisions that we can possibly make. So here is the plan. We plan to get back together in person the last Sunday of January. That is January the 31st. We're going to meet together again in person. And when we do, however, we're going to make a schedule change. And we will be talking to you more about this in the days and weeks to come. We haven't even decided yet exactly what it is. But what we want to do is come back together in one service. So rather than have two services that have 60, 70 people in them like we were doing, we're going to have one service and still give us plenty of room to spread out. We'll, of course, we'll still be doing our services and making them available online for those who are not able to come back yet. And so our plan is to be back together January 31st. Now, I want to ask you to pray uh, ask God to give us wisdom as you've been doing. Continue to just be flexible because we don't know what's going to happen between now and the end of the month. And I just want to ask you to, to, to keep giving us grace that if something were to take a turn for the worse, that we may have to make further adjustments. But at this time, our plan is to come back together in one service. Probably we'll change the service time in order to have our Bible study hour and one service after that. So we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. Now let me give you a little bit of the rationale behind why we're going to do this January the 31st. 
uh, we decided to go online only uh, December the 13th. We had already taken off the Sunday after uh, Thanksgiving. I say taken off. We'd gone online only because of the holiday. We just felt like that there was a potential that uh, with families getting together, with people traveling, uh, guests coming in with a lot of personal interaction going on with the people of the holidays, there was a greater chance that there would be spreader events that could cause people to, um, to spread this virus uh, more rapidly through the community. Well, that actually seems to be what has sort of happened in the, in the community. And so I believe God gave our church leadership wisdom and uh, going online only right after Thanksgiving. Well, come December 13th, we just decided that we felt like maybe that was the best thing to do until uh, January 3rd, and then we would reevaluate. And so that's what we've been doing over the last three weeks and then four weeks counting today. But what's going on in the community is this. Since November 26th, since Thanksgiving, hospitalizations in Collin County for people who are in the hospital because of COVID have gone up by 70%. Now, the governor's office uh, made um, sort of set some standards much earlier in the year. They said that if 15% of all the people who are in the hospitals are there because of COVID, then that sort of triggers uh, for restaurants, for example, to go back to 50, uh, 50% capacity, other types of events to, to scale back. Well, in November, uh, the end of November, around Thanksgiving, the hospitalization rate in Collin County was about 16%. Now that figure is up almost 25% uh, as of about a week ago. And so hospitalizations have gone up dramatically because of COVID. In addition to that, uh, the number of cases in Collin County, positive cases, have gone up by two and a half times. They've gone up from about 1,471 cases in early November to at the end, toward the end of December up to 3,800 and something positive cases uh, in, in the county. And so it has gone up two and a half times. In addition to that, I know of about 31 people in our church family that have tested positive in the last five or six weeks. And so we've had more people in our church family. And so as a result of all of those things, we just feel like right now is maybe the peak, the high point of where COVID is going to be. So we're hoping that now that the vaccine has been released and hopefully uh, we're going to peak and then it's going to start back down, then we're hoping and praying that at the end of this month, by the end of this month, that it will be a much safer environment for us to all get back together again. And so that's the rationale behind it. I know that uh, there are varying opinions on this. And as I've said over and over and over again, I just want to acknowledge to you, I am not an expert on this. I'm doing the best I can do with the data that I have. I'm relying on godly counsel and others. We want to be together. We want to do it as soon as we possibly can. But we also feel a love and a responsibility for you that we're trying to do that in the best, wisest, safest way possible. So whether you agree uh, with the decisions or not, I ask you for your prayers. Thank you that this year you have supported us. You have uh, kept us uh, together, you have supported, you have prayed for us, you've prayed for wisdom, you've kept uni you've stayed unified as a church, and I just ask you to continue to do that. That is absolutely critical for us to continue to be successful in the mission that the Lord has given us. So as we begin 2021, I begin this year with great anticipation that God is going to continue to work in us and through us in a great way. So would you bow with me in prayer and let's dedicate this new year to the Lord. Father, I thank you that 2020 did not catch you by surprise and it did not thwart your purposes or your plans. I thank you that what you've done, O oh Lord, has been marvelous. And God, you have done greater things than anybody could even begin to measure or begin to understand. I thank you that this year, this new year, is going to be filled with your blessings for your people but I also thank you, God, that you're going to continue to extend and expand your kingdom in our lives and around the world. We want to dedicate ourselves to you and ask you, Father, to use us 
in a great way this year. Anoint us, O Lord, with your power, with your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding of, Lord, how to be used, especially to touch this city of McKinney, how to impact, O Lord, this new high school that you are um, opening up next door this year. How, Lord, to touch the lives of the thousands of people that don't know Jesus, that our people who are watching right now have relationships with. Lord, would you give us guidance? Would you give us the power? Would you give us the words? Would you give us whatever we need to see multitudes come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ this year? Bless all of the works, O oh God, that we're involved in overseas and around this country. Lord, would you use this church to make an impact in the world? And Lord Jesus, wouldn't it be a great thing if you were to return this year? So Lord Jesus, we ask you to come. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. But I pray that until that time when you're ready to come, Lord, I pray that you would use us to bring many people to faith in Jesus. That's the only reason you haven't come back yet. You're not willing that any should perish. So Lord, use us to bring in the harvest, and then Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name.
Sometimes things happen to us in our lives, bad things, that uh, can have a dramatic impact on our lives. It can have a dramatic impact on how we feel about God and how we feel about maybe ourselves or others. It may be a tragedy that's happened to you or maybe even a tragedy that happened because of you. It might be a great loss that you've experienced, maybe someone or something that was very important to you that suddenly was taken away. It might be something that's happened to you. A bad thing that happened. Maybe you were taken advantage of. Maybe some great injustice took place. Or maybe someone abused you. Maybe verbally, maybe emotionally, maybe physically, maybe sexually. And maybe it was someone that you trusted and someone that should have been protecting you, but instead they were the one who took advantage of you. Sometimes bad things happen to us, tragic things happen to us that if we're not careful, we will allow the enemy can lie to us through those things and cause us to believe lies that dramatically impact the rest of our lives. Well, today, as we conclude this series on the genealogy of Jesus, we're going to look at the fourth woman listed in this genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. In the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew chapter 1, we see Matthew writing to show that Jesus was the legal right, he had a legal right to be the king of the Jews. For the prophets had said that the Messiah would be both a son of Abraham, a descendant of Abraham, but also a descendant of King David. He would have to be of the royal line of David. And so this genealogy is Matthew's way of showing us that Jesus really was the Messiah. He had the right to reign as the king of the Jews. But it's interesting that in this genealogy, Matthew lists 42 generations here. And of those 42 generations, he lists five women. Now, the last woman mentioned is the mother of Jesus, which would be an obvious one that we would expect to be mentioned. But the other four women that are mentioned that we're going to read in just a moment are, they're surprising. It's surprising that any women are mentioned at all. But the fact that these four women are mentioned would all, all of them would be probably women you would expect that would not be mentioned at all. And yet they are included intentionally by God. And what we've seen is over the last three weeks, and then today we conclude it, we see that God has a reason. God has a message for you and me of why he included these four women. So in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the scripture says, This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab. Amenadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. And Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And so we see here that the first one that is mentioned here is Tamar. And we saw several weeks ago that Tamar was a woman who was in a desperate situation. She was a desperate woman who made a wrong and a bad decision. But in spite of the fact that she made a bad decision out of her desperation, God still loved her. God still accepted her. God had a plan for her, and God still wanted to use her. We saw, second of all, that Rahab was a woman that the Bible says was a prostitute. She lived a very immoral and sinful life. But we learned from her that because she placed her faith, her imperfect faith in God, we saw that God forgave her, that God accepted her, 
that God had a plan for her and that God used her to bring his son into the world. And so no matter what decisions you've made that are wrong, God still wants to use you. No matter how sinful you've been, God still wants to use you. Last week, we looked at the third woman, and that was Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite, and we saw that Ruth came from a very dysfunctional family, a very uh, pagan society and a pagan people that she came from. And we learned that no matter where you've come from, no matter what kind of family you grew up in, God still loves you, and God wants to bless you, and God wants to use you. And now, today... We want to look at the fourth lady, and that is the woman who was Uriah's wife, the the genealogy says, but we know her by the name of Bathsheba. Now, Bathsheba is always associated with David, and we know her from this account where we think of King David and and him, this man who was uh, a beloved um, man who loved God with all of his heart. The Bible says a man after God's own heart, and yet David, in a moment of of weakness, in a moment of temptation, he succumbs to it, and he is uh, he has an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. That's what we always think of, and when we think of Bathsheba, we often associate her in an adulterous affair with King David. So she's thought of often as an adulteress. But what I want you to see today, and what I want to suggest to you today, is really. I don't think that's what the scripture teaches. I don't think Bathsheba had anything to do with this at all. I think Bathsheba is listed in this genealogy because Bathsheba was a woman who had something really bad and something really traumatic happen to her. Something that happened to her she could not do anything about that had great ramifications for her life. And yet in spite of that, in spite of what happened to her, God blessed her, and God used her in a great way. Now, I want you to see that we oftentimes think of Bathsheba. She's often presented as though she somehow was complicit in this uh, affair with David. And so somehow she was partially at least to blame. Though after all, uh, we all think of the fact that she's up on the top of her roof uh, bathing and she's naked. And so David is sitting there and he sees her. And so he falls into temptation. And so we all think, well, why would she be doing that? And, and you know, she's at least uh, partially to blame. She's either accidentally um, led him into temptation or she maybe even did it on purpose. However, I want you to see that the Bible does not say that. The Bible doesn't say that Bathsheba was on the top of her Ruth, bath- Ruth bathing. Uh, that's something we've invented in our mind. Let's, let's go to the scriptures in 2 Samuel chapter 11. I just want to read first few verses of this, and I want you to pay attention to how it describes what happened here. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. You know the rest of the story. David finds out she's pregnant. He sends for Uriah. He's hoping Uriah will go home uh, for a few days, sleep with his wife, and then they can say it's Uriah's baby. But Uriah has got too much integrity. He sleeps at the foot of the at the front door of the palace. He says, "How can I go home and be with my wife when my comrades are out at war? I'll not do that." So then David gets him drunk and hopes that in his drunkenness he will go home, but he will not do it. So then David arranges to have Uriah killed in battle. 
David murders Uriah. And so then David takes Bathsheba to be his wife, and, um, and then they have a baby, the baby dies. And so there's just so much pain and so much trauma here. But I want you to think about this from Bathsheba's point of view. The scripture says that David was the one on the roof, not Bathsheba. It doesn't say she was on the roof bathing. It says David was on the roof walking around looking. And while he was in the palace looking down, he saw a woman bathing. As far as we know, he may have looked from his vantage point on the top of the palace. He may have looked through a window. Or maybe he looked into a private courtyard. She had no idea that David was being a peeping Tom, that he was looking where he shouldn't have been looking. And so she's not guilty of that at all. So David, seeing her, sees that she's a beautiful woman. He sends messengers to find out about her. The messengers come back and they say to him, this is the wife of Uriah. I want you to think about this. The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 23 that David had 37 mighty men, 37 men who were top-notch warriors. They were the elite forces of his army. And these 37 were called his mighty men. And one of those special forces, one of those guys who were devoted to David was this woman's husband, Uriah. But then it says, that she was the daughter of Eliam. Eliam is also listed in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel as one of his mighty men. And then the scripture says there in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel that Eliam was the son of Ahithophel. Ahithophel, we know, was one of David's most trusted counselors. So I want you to get the picture. When David sends to inquire about this woman that he sees, he finds out, first of all, she's married. That should have been all that was to it. But she's not only just married, she's married to one of the men who are devoted to David, one of his 37 mighty men. She is the daughter of one of his mighty men, and she is the granddaughter of his most trusted counselor. I mean, everything in the scenario is saying, don't do this. And yet David goes against everything that he knew to be right. And he sins for her. Now, you got to get this. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know that David's been up on the top of the palace looking at her, has formed lustful thoughts in his heart and desires her. She doesn't know this. She's just taken her ceremonial bath. She is going about her business, and there's a knock at the door, and suddenly there's messengers saying, the king is sending for you. He wants you to come see him. I would suspect, I, I don't know this, the Bible doesn't say this, but I would imagine that suddenly her heart jumps up in her throat. She knows her husband's off at war. Her dad is off at war. She's thinking to herself, the king is sending for me. Maybe he has word from what's going on in the battle. Maybe my husband Uriah has been killed or wounded, or maybe it's my dad, or maybe something's happened to my grandfather, who's one of his counselors. So I'm sure she's thinking she's going to the palace to see the king for some information that he's trying to give to her. Her heart is probably racing. She gets there. They escort her into the king's chambers. She's expecting the king to say something to her, and instead of that, he makes sexual advances toward her. I think she's shocked. I think she's stunned. I think, given the fact what we know is that she's, you know, his grand, her grandfather was one of David's counselors. Her dad is one of his mighty men. I think this probably implies that Bathsheba is maybe a great deal younger than David. David is the king. He is sovereign. He can do anything he wants to do, basically. So here is this young woman who's taken totally by surprise. She's in the king's chambers. The doors are probably shut and locked. The only people there are the ones who went to get her. She is in a situation that she can't even say no. She has no, no, no way to protest what's going on. And so the king basically takes advantage of her 
Now I got to tell you, when I first started thinking about this, this, this bothered me and I, I don't know how to exactly explain it. How is it that somehow we're more comfortable with, you know, we can forgive David for being a, an adulterer. We can, we can say, well, that was a terrible thing, but he repented and, and that he was a murderer. He killed Uriah and somehow we can forgive him for that. But to think of David as a sexual abuser, that David used his position, that he, he actually did what in our day and age, in our country today, it is against the law and it is a crime and it's called sexual misconduct. It's when someone in a position of authority uses that authority to, to, to take advantage of someone under their authority. And that's exactly what David did. And then when it's over, he sends her home. She goes home and she probably is thinking to herself, what just happened? I, I, I can't tell anybody this. I can't tell my husband. I, I can't tell my dad. Who am I going to tell? And who would believe me anyway? And if the king denies it, well, who's going to take my word over his? And I, I don't want to get the king in trouble. And, and, and I don't know what was going through her mind. She's stunned. She's in shock. She's probably feeling ashamed. She feels guilty. She probably feels dirty. She probably, she feels awful. Several weeks go by, maybe a couple of months go by. And one day she sends word to David, I'm pregnant. Well, David tries to fix matters, but you know the story. Next thing you know, the man who took advantage of her sexually has her husband killed. Bathsheba is traumatized. And then David, after a period of time, I guess whatever he perceived to be respectful, period of mourning, brings her to the palace, basically takes her as his wife, which means Really, he adds her to his harem. And she, her whole life is dramatically changed. Then she has the baby. And as a judgment of God upon David, the baby gets sick and her baby dies. She's been sexually abused. Her husband has been killed by her abuser, and now her baby dies. This is something that happened to her. She's a victim here. It was not her fault. Nowhere does the Bible ever lay any blame on Bathsheba, but rather the Bible lays the blame solely on David. When Nathan the prophet went in and confronted David over this great evil that he had done, he laid it squarely at David's feet. And in fact, he compares Bathsheba to a, a little lamb, a little innocent lamb. What we find from the story is that Bathsheba was someone that had had some really bad, traumatic things happen to her. But you see, God has a plan for your life just like he had a plan for her life. And no matter what has happened to you in your life, no matter how bad it's been, no matter how traumatic it has been, God still loves you. And God has a plan for you. And God wants to bless you. And God wants to greatly use you. For we see that later on, David repents. Psalm 51 tells us of David's repentance. And this story of his repentance is he is broken before the Lord and he's so sorry. And I think if he was genuinely repentant before the Lord, then I think he was repentant toward Bathsheba. And I think he probably asked her forgiveness. But what we know is that he comforted her, the Bible says, and then she became pregnant again and she gives birth to a son whose name is Solomon. Now, when she has this baby... It's important, I believe, that the Bible specifically says that the Lord loved Solomon. 
And he sent Nathan the prophet with this particular word. He said, go tell Bathsheba and David to name him Jedidiah. Because that word Jedidiah, the name Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. I think that was important because I don't know, maybe she was feeling like, could God bless this relationship after all the hard things that we've been through to get where we are, the horrible way it started. And God says, name this baby Jedidiah. It means beloved of the Lord. I love this baby. We know that somewhere in there, David promised Bathsheba that this child, Solomon, will succeed me as king. He will be heir to the throne. Now, Solomon was not the oldest son. Bathsheba wasn't the only wife. He had many wives. He had many sons. But Solomon was the choice. Bathsheba's son would be king. And so when David is on his deathbed, basically Bathsheba comes before him and says, you remember what you promised? And David said, yes. And he proclaimed Solomon the king and Bathsheba becomes the queen mother, the most respected, influential woman in the kingdom. We're told in, in 1 Kings chapter 2 that when after David has died, that Bathsheba comes before Solomon to ask him a question. And when Bathsheba walks into his presence, Solomon gets up off his throne and bows before her and then calls for a throne to be brought in to sit beside him, and Bathsheba sits on the throne beside her son, Solomon. You see, God was honoring this woman. He had a plan for her life. Later on in his life, Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. All through the book of Proverbs, Solomon talks about honoring your mother, honoring your father. We get to the last chapter of Proverbs, and then it suddenly changes, and it says, these are the words of King Lemuel. Who is King Lemuel? It says King Lemuel learned these words from his mother. Well, there was no king in Israel or in Judah by the name of Lemuel. It is thought that this was a nickname for Solomon, perhaps a nickname given by his mother. It means beloved of God. And so we think, most scholars think, that this was the words of Solomon learned from his mother, Bathsheba. The last chapter of Proverbs, Bathsheba taught Solomon. He said, she says, stay away from immoral women. She says, stay away from strong alcoholic drink. Kings don't need to be messing with that. And then she says, defend those who can't defend themselves. And then Solomon goes into a description of the virtuous woman. Maybe, just maybe, he was describing his mother, Bathsheba. Well, what we know is this. We know that in Matthew chapter 1, when the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ is being revealed, we are told that this woman, Bathsheba, was part of the genealogy. She was an ancestor of the Messiah of Israel, our Savior. God chose this woman to bring his son into the world. And so no matter what has happened to you, no matter how traumatic, how unfair, how abusive it has been, no matter what it is, God has a plan for your life. And God wants to bless you. And God wants to use you. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. Do you know that one out of every three women, statistics say one out of every three women will be sexually abused at some point in their life? And one out of every six men? That means I'm talking to some of you who've been through sexual abuse. And I've never been through that, so I can't possibly begin to understand maybe how you feel or maybe all the lies that the enemy wants to tell you about God. He may tell you that God doesn't care, that God doesn't, is not involved, that God didn't protect you, that God doesn't want you. He may lie to you about yourself and tell you that you're no good, that you're somehow damaged and broken, and that God can't and doesn't want to use you. I don't know what he's saying to you, but I want to tell you, you've got to view yourself the way God views you. That when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are completely accepted by God. And God wants to use you. 
God has a plan for your life, and God wants to greatly bless you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I encourage you to do that today, that you would cry out to him and ask him to save you from your sins and place your life in his hands and let God bring about his good and wonderful plan for you. If you have given your life to Jesus, but you are one of these people who have had bad things happen to you, whatever it might be, whether it was abuse or some other kind of uh, hardship come to you, come your way, God wants you to know today by these genealogies, the people in this genealogy, he intentionally wanted you to know that no matter what kind of bad decisions you've made, no matter how sinful you've been, no matter what you come from, or no matter what's happened to you, God loves you. God wants to bless you. God wants to use you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. I want to pray for you right now. Father, for those who do not know Jesus, who are watching right now, I pray that you would draw them to your son. Would you let them know how much you love them right now? Draw them to Jesus and may they cry out to you and be saved. I pray that those who are watching right now, Lord, those who have had traumatic things happen to them, I pray that somehow you would give them the faith to cry out to you and entrust their life into your hands and let go of all these things that have happened to them and to give themselves to you, to trust you. And I pray you would bless them, you would bring great good into their lives, and I pray that you would use them in a great and mighty way. Lord, may they see you at work in them. I thank you that, Lord, you have, have a message for someone who's watching this today. And I pray that you would change their life through the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed with me and have given your life to the Lord or you have uh, somehow recommitted your life to the Lord, then there's some numbers on the screen that you can you can respond to, and you can text us and let us know of your decision. And we would love to get back with you and talk with you further and be a part of what God wants to do and being a blessing and a, a great uh, help to you. And so would you let us know that by responding to those numbers? Also, I want to encourage you to, uh, to continue to faithfully support the church by giving your offerings to the, to the Lord, by giving them to our church. You can do that by going online at brookhavenchurch.com slash give, and there you can give your offerings. You've been so generous. You've been so faithful. I trust you're going to continue to do that. And so may the Lord bless you, and may this new year be filled with God's abundant blessings for you, and may he use you. And may he use your family in a great way for his glory.